Hi, my name is Mark Hannington. I am an economic geologist in the Marine Mineral Resources Group, and I'm going to be talking about the potential of marine minerals from the deep sea as a supply of future uh, raw materials. So why are we interested in marine minerals from the deep ocean? The world's population today is about 7 billion people. By 2050, the population will be in excess of 9.7 billion people. And with that growth comes an enormous demand for raw materials, the materials that are required to build the infrastructure for cities, for transportation networks, for energy distribution, but also the materials that are required for the increasingly intensive use of metals in uh, electronics, in high technology, and especially in green technology. And this demand is encouraging an increasing interest in alternative supplies of metals including metals potentially from the deep sea. A major question, however, is uh, the extent to which ocean resources might uh, contribute to this demand for uh, metal supply. What metals can we get from the deep sea? The deep sea is mainly, deep sea mining, is mainly concerned with three types of mineral resources. They include manganese nodules, cobalt-rich manganese crusts, and seafloor massive sulfide deposits. Crusts and nodules are potential resources of a variety of metals, including cobalt, copper, and nickel, and manganese, and some important trace elements like the platinum growth elements and uh, the so-called rare earth elements. The massive sulfide deposits, on the other hand, are potential sources of potentially much more valuable elements, such as copper, zinc, uh, silver, and gold. But by far the greatest interest for deep sea mining, in the near term at least, is manganese nodules. And manganese nodules are essentially solid concretions of iron and manganese oxides that form uh, about the size of a small potato uh, and cover large parts of the deep ocean floor. They grow from the metals that are dissolved in ordinary seawater and by a phenomenon which is referred to as hydrogenetic growth, if the metals are coming out of seawater, and also from metals dissolved in pore waters in sediments below the seafloor, um, and that's referred to as diagenetic growth. Manganese nodules were originally discovered during uh, a very early research expedition of, uh, expedition of the HMS Challenger in about 1872. But now we know that they are widely distributed in the oceans, in the deep ocean basins. And they're found at water depths anywhere from 4,000 meters to about 6,000 meters, which makes them hard to get to, in areas particularly where the rate of sedimentation is very low, typically less than one centimeter of sediment uh, deposition in, in, per thousand years. This low sedimentation rate is required to prevent the burial of the manganese nodules because they get their metals from seawater and they have, to be, they have to be continually exposed in order to grow. And in some parts of the oceans, such as in the Central Pacific and in the Indian Ocean, the nodules cover more than 50% of the seafloor. So if you could walk on the seafloor, you could barely take a step without stepping on a nodule over huge areas of the oceans. The other resource that people are interested in are manganese crusts, which are very similar to nodules because they are also composed of mainly manganese oxides and iron oxides. The minerals of interest or the elements of interest are adsorbed into the manganese and iron oxides at relatively small concentrations. Unlike nodules, the crusts actually grow on a rocky substrate and they can accumulate to in black layers up to 30 centimeters or, or more in thickness. The crusts are also found throughout the world's oceans, but they tend to be found only on the tops of very large seamounts. And this is an important location because the tops of large seamounts are swept clean of the sediments that we have to prevent from accumulating on the crusts. If they're buried, they can't grow from the, sea, from the elements dissolved in seawater. Also, the crusts, because they grow on tops of seamounts, they occur at a much larger range of water depths. Nodules are at 4,000 meters to 6,000 meters, whereas crusts are forming as shallow as 500 meters, which does make them more accessible. So where do the metals come from? There's a very small amount of iron and manganese dissolved in ordinary seawater, and under the right conditions, it'll it will form invisible small particles, submicroscopic particles that we call nanoparticles, uh, that are attracted electrostatically to each other and to exposed surfaces like rock surfaces or a small sand grain on the seafloor. 
The manganese oxide particles, they have a negative surface charge. So the surface of the manganese oxide is electrostatically negative. And it will attract positively charged ions dissolved in seawater, such as cobalt and nickel and copper, that are also present in seawater at very low concentrations. The iron oxides, which are actually um, equally abundant in the manganese crust, they have, a, posit they have a, a positive surface charge, so they attract elements that are dissolved in seawater as negative ions. For example, hydroxy oxyanions of elements like molybdenum, uh, vanadium, arsenic, and the rare earth elements. So together, the manganese oxides and the iron oxides absorb a large quantity of these very rare elements dissolved in seawater, and that's the, uh, the resource of interest. Over time, these particles uh, accumulate as, as the nodules and crust, commonly nucleated on a small object, a sand grain, a shell, or in the case of crust, on exposed rock surfaces. But because the surfaces of the nodules and the crust must be continually exposed, there has been a great deal of debate about how this happens. In the deep ocean, this can happen because we have naturally low sedimentation rates in some parts of the world's ocean. On the seamounts, it happens because they are swept clean. Some observers have suggested that marine organisms, benthic organisms, actually turn the nodules continuously and bring them continuously to the seafloor where they can be exposed. This is an idea, but nobody's actually ever seen it happen. How long do they take to form? The concentrations of metals in nodules are many millions of times enriched compared to background seawater. And achieving this level of enrichment takes a huge amount of time, a very long amount of time. Nodules grow at rates of only a few millimeters per year, maybe a centimeter per million years. So a nodule the size of a small potato could be hundreds of thousands and even millions of years old. What's fascinating is that this process is taking place on such a large scale throughout the ocean basins that it's actually modified and had a measurable impact on the chemistry of the oceans themselves. So those are two uh, resources that people are interested in. The others, of course, are the so-called black smoker deposits. These are the deposits of metallic sulfides that form by hydrothermal fluids emitted from active submarine volcanoes. Most people have heard of black smokers or the tube worm colonies that live around such hydrothermal vents. And certainly the discovery of the first black smokers in the 1980s, early 1980s, and especially their link to chemosynthetic life was one of the most compelling and significant scientific advances uh, in the last century. Now more than uh, uh, 30 or 40 years later, we recognize that there are at least 500 of these sites of hydrothermal activity uh, on the seafloor where sulfide minerals, metallic sulfide minerals, are precipitating uh, from these hydrothermal vents. That sounds like a big number, but in fact we have only explored a very small number of the submarine, active submarine volcanoes, um, and many more remain to be explored. About two-thirds of the black smoker deposits that we know about occur on the mid-ocean ridges. This is the 60,000 kilometer long um, uh, break in the Earth's crust where new oceanic crust is forming. And it's the loss of heat from that crust that is responsible for the hydrothermal activity um, that occurs along the ridges. So at the plate boundaries where, where the hydrothermal activity is occurring, uh, the magma wells up from the Earth's interior and new ocean crust is being produced at an astonishing rate of about 20 to 30 cubic kilometers per year. And as that hot crust moves away from the uh, mid-ocean ridges, it cools, in part by the conduction of heat through the lithosphere, but also by hydrothermal convection. That is to say, seawater that leaks into the crust to depths of as much as two or three kilometers below the seafloor and literally mines the heat from the new oceanic crust. This process is responsible for an enormous exchange of mass and energy with tens of thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of black smokers continually drawing heat from the Earth's interior. Just one of these black smoker complexes can generate 100 megawatts of thermal power, which is enough to uh, energize a small city. So where do those metals, however, where do the metals that occur in black smokers come from? When the cold water leaks into the crust, along fractures and fissures, it's heated to temperatures of as much as 400 degrees. And at these very high temperatures, the fluids become buoyant and then rise very rapidly to the seafloor. But because seawater contains about three and a half weight percent of dissolved salts, 
at 400 degrees, it also becomes highly corrosive, and it literally leaches or strips metals from the rock, in particular iron and copper and zinc and also silver and gold that become part of the black smoker chimneys and the deposits that form on the seafloor. These fluids also leach sulfur in the form of dissolved hydrogen sulfide, which is the essential part of the food chain for the organisms, the chemosynthetic life that live around the hydrothermal vents. So the same sulfur that the tube worms and the bacteria are living on is also combining with the metals to produce the mineral deposits on the seafloor. And yet all of that is toxic to us, even in small quantities. The metals accumulate in the chimneys that form around the vents, uh, in part by the precipitation of what's referred to as black smoke, a black smoker with billowing plumes of particles of metallic sulfides. This is what we normally see at high temperature hydrothermal vents where the high temperature fluids mix very quickly and quench in contact with cold seawater to produce tiny particles of metallic sulfides that we call smoke. The chimney-like structures that form around the vents, and here you can see the vent hole from a chimney, um, also form from the same minerals, the metallic iron sulfides, the copper sulfides, and the zinc sulfides that contain the important commodities that seafloor miners are actually interested in. The big difference between a black smoker deposit and a nodule in terms of how they form is that these can form in a fraction of the time that it takes a million-year-old nodule to, to accumulate. So this process, both processes, are geologically very important in terms of the history of the Earth. In fact, both nodules and black smoker deposits are part of a very large geochemical flywheel that buffers ocean chemistry. So about 34% of the crustal heat is removed by hydrothermal convection at black smoker vents. This equates to a global hydrothermal flux, which is large enough to circulate the entire volume of the world's oceans through the mid-ocean ridges about every 10 million years. That sounds like a long time, but the Earth is about 4 billion years old, so every 10 million years is a huge amount of hydrothermal circulation. This process has been going on for a very long time. In fact, it's one of the oldest geological processes on Earth after seafloor volcanism. In fact, black smoker vents are a kind of living fossil because identical chimneys in ancient oceans, millions and millions of years ago, were also producing large and valuable mineral deposits that we mine on land today. In fact, some of the oldest mineral deposits that are mined on land are as old as three and a half billion years old. Fossils of ancient vent organisms, such as tube worms that we see in modern vents, have also been found in such deposits. And they're beautifully preserved, for example, in ancient massive sulfide deposits in the Urals Mountains, where geologists have found fossil tube worms that are as much as 400 million years old. So how much metal can we actually get from black smoker deposits? This is a very large question. Unfortunately, we still have only a very limited understanding of the global resource potential of these deposits. Current estimates of the amount of massive sulfide deposited in black smokers are on the order of 500 million tons to more than 5,000 million tons. These are big numbers, but we really don't know whether the black smoker deposits could contribute significantly to global metal supply. On the planet today, we're consuming about 16 million tons of copper metal a year. And the black smoker deposits that we know about could satisfy that demand for maybe a few years. Vast areas of the ocean floor, however, still remain to be explored for these resources and a proper resource assessment to know whether or not they could contribute significantly to long-term metal supply uh, simply hasn't been done. In contrast to black smoker deposits, we know that manganese nodules are enormously abundant. And they are formed from these tiny particles, these nanoparticles in seawater over very, very long periods of time to produce a global abundance of manganese nodules on the order of trillions of tons. These are truly astronomical numbers. And just in the areas of the Central Pacific that are currently claimed for uh, manganese nodule exploration, they cover nearly a third of the area of, of continental Europe. Vast areas, tens of thousands of kilometers in, uh, covered by manganese nodules. That's enough manganese and nickel and copper and cobalt to supply the planet with those metals for decades, and in the case of manganese, maybe even for centuries. Much of the technology for the recovery of manganese nodules is already built, 
and some of the exploration licenses that uh, were granted uh, 13 years ago are set to expire within the next two years. And the expectation is that those exploration licenses will uh, become exploitation licenses. But the question arises, do we need these resources now? And if not now, uh, when do we need those resources? So with this basic understanding of the potential of metallic mineral resources as nodules, crusts, or massive sulfides, um, we can begin to address this basic question. Is seafloor mining a solution for the raw material needs of the future? The technology to achieve it is not a barrier, but the possibility of mining nodules and seafloor massive sulfides is stirring considerable debate about the sustainable use of this new resource and whether commercial development is actually worth the risk.